What's a good word, Pete? Well, Tech, I got me a helper now. Name's Dan, and I'm about to break him in on some small jobs in the shop. Uh, hope this is everything you want, Pete. Uh, it looks like it, Danny boy. Just set it here and then say hello to Master Tech. Hi, Tech. Hello yourself, Dan. I hear you're going to be Pete's ace in the hole. You mean Pete's hole in the head to hear him tell us. Ah, Danny, I was only kidding. Come on, let's get cracking on those windshield wipers. What's with those wipers, Pete? Why, the owner reports that they're noisy because they're slapping up against both the center bar and lower molding. So I'm going to replace the motor and link assembly. You're going to do what? Holy Jupiter. Anybody can junk a motor and put in a whole new unit. Why don't you find the real trouble and fix it and save the owner some money? Well, you've got a good point, Tech. Motors are hard to get these days. So, Dan, here's how you ought to go about tackling a typical windshield wiper job. When a car first comes into the shop, it pays to wet the windshield and check the sweep of both blades. If the sweeps are both equalized, but are in slightly different positions on the glass, it's just a matter of relocating the blade arms on their pivots. For example, if the blade hits the center bar, leaving an uncleaned area above the molding, move the arm one serration toward the lower molding. But if the blade slapping the molding and isn't cleaning near the center bar, move the arm one serration toward the bar. You might have to relocate more than one serration, but it's wise to begin with only one. Check and then adjust for keeps. When one wiper sweeps a larger area than the other, you've got bent arms and links or looseness to worry about. So, checking the sweep is the place to begin. Okay. I'll keep those things in mind. Fine. Now, in this case, both blades sweep too far. They hit the center bar and lower molding. So, let's pull out the motor and linkage assembly and look it over. Now, the first thing we'd better do is look for looseness at the linkage. Check where the shaft arm fastens to the crank arm at the hex nut on the intermediate arm stud and check the fit of the stud in the crank. And will you take a look at that? The fit of the intermediate arm stud on this crank arm is really sloppy. Why, the stud nut itself is very loose. Would tightening that nut take care of it? No, Dan, because the rectangular hole in the crank arm is pounded out of shape. The stud wouldn't stay tight in the crank with the hole worn like that. Well, while you're at it, fellas... You'd better check the rubber grommets at the ends of the links. What's so special about those? Well, if those grommets were over-lubricated to eliminate squeaks, the rubber could have gotten spongy. That causes a clicking noise in the linkage. Yeah, Dan. The best way to lubricate those grommets is with powdered graphite. Okay. I'll keep it in mind. Anything else? Yeah. A link can bend if the blades are frozen to the glass and the wiper motor started without freeing the blades. <laughs> or some muscle-bound serviceman can bend the links if he forces the arms while cleaning the glass. Now, if a link is bent so it's too long, the pivot arm can go over center when the blade is at the center bar. That can cause a wiper motor to jam. A link bent too short limits the stroke and the blade might hit the lower molding. In either case, or with loose linkage like on this job, here's the best correction. Use this new wiper motor linkage assembly. It's got a long crank lever, a short lever and shaft, and two links. That assembly represents a real improvement, Dan. All the parts are much stronger, and they're now available for replacement of earlier linkage assemblies. You'll find part numbers for the various models in this reference book. Okay. And installing the improved parts will take care of this job in fine shape, hey? Right, old Dan. But here's an important point. When you relocate a blade arm, be sure to hold it in its parked position while you tighten the acorn nut. Otherwise, you're apt to bend the operating link. I see. Now, does that wind up this wiper deal? Well, just about, Dan. Except for one more point. If everything on a windshield wiper job appears to be all right, 
but the sweep of the blades is too great. It's probably because the pivot arm is too short. So, replace the pivot assembly with the latest type. Okay, that's a good story. I think I can fix them now. Good. And now there's some other new features we can talk about. Like that new starter drive, for instance. Hey, Tech? You can say that again, Pete. That starter drive is a honey. Dodge cars have it, too. It's called the follow-through drive, Dan, because it stays engaged to the flywheel until the engine starts and continues to run. Oh, oh. so that's why Pete wanted this starter drive out of stock. Yeah, Dan, follow-through drive is a real improvement. Other type starter drives can go out of engagement with the flywheel when only one or two cylinders fire, resulting in false starts. So every now and then, an owner would have to turn the ignition key two or three times before the engine started and continued to run. What holds the new drive in engagement, Pete? A small spring-loaded detent pin, Dan. It's built into the control nut inside the pinion and barrel assembly. That's the pinion that moves outward on its screw shaft when the starter motor armature shaft turns. And as the pinion moves outward, the detent pin rides on top of the screw thread until the pinion engages the flywheel. When that point is reached, the detent pin drops into a notch machined in the screw thread. And that's what holds the starter pinion in engagement with the flywheel. How long does that pin stay in the notch? Well, if the engine fires once or twice and then dies, the pinion keeps cranking the engine as long as the ignition key is held in start position. When the engine fires and keeps on running, the flywheel begins to drive the starter pinion. Somewhere between 360 and 400 RPM, the centrifugal force acts on the detent pin, overcoming its spring tension and disengaging the pin from the notch. That lets the pinion return to its at-rest position on the screw shaft. Suppose that pin gets stuck and doesn't come out of the notch. Oh, that's not very likely to happen, Dan, but if it does happen, there's a safety device built into the screw shaft. You see, the new screw shaft is made in two sections connected by a ratchet clutch. So if the pinion end of the screw shaft is turned faster than the armature end, the ratchet clutch is disengaged preventing the engine from driving the armature shaft. Now, here's something else. Another spring-loaded pin called an anti-drift pin is also built into the control nut. This pin keeps the pinion from drifting into the flywheel when the engine is running. In the start position, this anti-drift pin is just off a ramp formed by a machined area at the beginning of the thread on the screw shaft. When the starter armature shaft revolves, the anti-drift pin climbs up the ramp and lets the pinion travel out the screw shaft. I get it, Pete. It's a pretty neat starter drive. What's more, Dan, this new type of starter drive can be installed on earlier model Plymouth or Dodge cars that used a Bendix drive. The reference book gives the story on that. Good point, Tech. Okay, Pete. Now let's turn this record over and cover some other servicing items. What you gonna talk about next, Pete? The clutch disc, Tech. We're putting one in that car over there. Dan ought to know the complete clutch disc story. Well, I know a clutch disc ought to be replaced when it's worn out. The disc just works when you shift gears, right? I knew you'd say that. The clutch disc works all the time the car's in motion, Dan. Oh, you tell him, Pete. Well, to begin with, Dan, you know that the flywheel does a pretty good job of smoothing out the normal power impulses of the engine. But the flywheel doesn't take out all the vibrations, and some of them can reach the transmission. Now, you know, of course, that clearances have to be maintained between the various parts of the transmission. Sure. If you didn't have clearance, you couldn't shift gears. Right. Now, because of those clearances, the torsional vibrations coming from the engine would result in what you might call sympathetic vibrations in the transmission. This would cause these parts to vibrate against each other, which could produce noise. And that's where the clutch disc comes to the rescue. <laughs> yeah, Tech. You see, Dan, the clutch disc smooths out those torsional vibrations, so power will flow evenly into the transmission. But remember, torsional vibrations vary with different engine and transmission combinations. 
so the clutch damper has to be calibrated to work with a specific combination. That means the hub springs and friction characteristics have to be just right. Yeah, and that's why you can't install just any clutch disc and expect it to work right. You gotta use one designed for the car you're working on. It's a good point, Tech. Now, Dan, you'll notice the clutch disc has a spring-loaded hub. That lets the hub move in relation to the outer part of the disc. Hmm. I wondered what those springs were for. Well, in addition to carrying the driving torque of the engine, those springs allow for the movement of the hub. But that's not all of the story. The movement has to be controlled. Yeah. So friction shims are put between the hub and the main part of the disc to restrict the spring movement. Like a shock absorber controls car spring movement. Holy cow! I didn't realize the clutch disc was that important. Yep, it's a pretty important member of the drivetrain, Dan. So you want to keep in mind, if an owner says there is a noise or a vibration in his transmission during deceleration, oh, from about 45 to 35 miles an hour, or during acceleration from about 25 to 30 miles an hour, that's your clue to suspect the clutch disc of not doing its job.